Ainda é cedo, amor Mal começaste a conhecer a vida Já anuncias a hora de partida Saber mesmo Welcome, everyone. que irás tomar Preste atenção, querida Embora eu saiba que está resolvida Em cada esquina cai um pouco tua vida Em pouco tempo não serás mais o que é Preste atenção, o mundo é um moinho Vai triturar teus sonhos tão mesquinhos Vai reduzir as ilusões a pó Preste atenção, querido We're going to get started in just a moment Welcome to everyone who's arriving just listening to some very relaxing music. I hope tonight's talk will be relaxing and fun after a long day's work for many people. Although some people may be joining from the early morning like Susan Besterfield in New Zealand. Welcome. Okay, I might turn off now as people are filing in. So welcome everyone to Greater Than Talks. Tonight's session is Freelancers Against Precarity. And we're gonna jump into that topic in just a minute. Um, I'm your host, Kate Beecroft. I'm a partner at Greater Than, where my focus is on helping organizations grow their ecosystem and communities. Um, so first of all, let's do a little bit of admin. And I'm sure all of you joining our Zoom pros by now. Um, but this will be a recorded meeting and it's already recorded. Um, if you dissent against this, that is totally cool. You have two options. Turn off your video and change your name <laughs> or jump out and we'll send you the video to watch later. But otherwise, we would really love to see your faces. Um, so please turn your videos on if you, if you can. It's always super nice when we're in these calls to be able to kind of react to the faces in the crowd and scroll through and see people's smiles and frowns and, and question faces. But do please keep your microphones muted um, for tonight's talk, which is less interactive than we'd usually do. We're trying a new format, the talking heads format. <laughs> um, I invite you to make lots of comments and ask questions um, related to the points that our speakers who I'm about to introduce make. And I'll just keep checking that, the comments in the chat to pull out the interesting stuff and we can circle back to the good questions that come through in our question segment at, towards the end of the call. Hello to everyone joining. We're just getting started introducing our subject for tonight, which is freelancers against precarity. Has there ever been a moment when it is clearer that people, community and collaboration are everything? And these seem like obvious truths in this new world of work that we find ourselves in, um, because ma in many ways we have the power to build and design working situations that meet our needs. And yet often we find ourselves alone and precarious, searching for others, searching for connection and needing more learning in our work. It doesn't actually have to be this way. And that's what we're excited to share with you tonight. Um, all around the world, freelancers, collectives, communities, networks are creating caring and belonging. They're sharing livelihoods, opportunities, and Greater Them is one of them. So we're here tonight to share more about what we're learning. And if you're joining from a collective, a community, I can see some faces in, in the crowd please just uh, say in the chat we, which freelancers collective or community or network that you're joining from or if you're a freelancer who's just interested in learning more we'd love to hear from you in the chat so 
A key point is that going against the precarious nature of the lone freelancer or consultant is important. But the other important part for us is without giving up autonomy. So this is not a talk about unionizing. It's a discussion and sharing of stories about the things we've tried to achieve that kind of have this balance of working together, learning together, caring about each other, but also with a lot of autonomy. Um, so our speakers will talk about some things we've tried internally as a collective, and we'll introduce what we do externally, like our services to the world, but only quickly. We have three more webinars in this series that will dive into those subjects, and Fran and Susan will talk about that in a little bit more. But yeah, so let's talk. Uh, let's move to our speakers, our talkers in this talk. Who are you? And how do you find yourself in this call with us tonight, part of Greater Than, in this journey against uh, precarity? I'll start with you, Susan. Thanks, Kate, and welcome, everyone. So lovely, as always, to see so many faces, new and old from around the world, uh, interested in the same, well, in the same things. And I, yeah, for me, I think I have maybe a well, I always, everybody likes to think they're special, right? Um, I spent 25 years in senior leadership positions in big corporations, big multinationals like IBM and HP and dare I, dare I say it, uh, British Petroleum. And I, I found myself losing my soul more and more quickly. And in 2014, I stepped out of a corporate office for the last time. Well, I do do a little bit of work with them from a consulting posture now and uh, reinvented my relationship to work. And through the fertile soil that is in spiral, which I'm sure many of you know or have, have been familiar with, I started to reimagine what my relationship to work, what my relationship to uh, others um, in in my in my way of enacting my work could be. And over many experiments, which I'm sure we'll delve into in more detail, I find myself here, a partner in this collective of amazing brains and hearts called Greater Than. That's my story. What about you, Stefan? My story is going to be difficult to keep short, but I will. I will, I promise. Um, yeah, I, um, I think in a, in, a, in a nutshell, I found my way into greater than through, um, uh, through, I guess, flirting with notions of a side hustle many years ago. Uh, I used to have a podcast. I used to try to do everything on my own on the side while working as a government employee because I thought, oh, that's what you do if you want to you know, follow your, your passion. podcast. If you guys want to listen to a very poorly edited uh, podcast episode, you can Google search Stefan Morales, Joshua Vile, uh, the Working Together podcast. I'm not going to put the link in, in chat, so <laughs> kind of embarrassed by that one a bit. Um, but you can, you can listen to an interesting conversation between me and, and Josh. Um, and that connection with Josh uh, maintained itself uh, into a group called Peer Garden, which lasted, I think, for about a year. And Peer Garden was kind of um, a lot of folks from within the Inspiral community and other uh, communities adjacent to it, uh, of folks supporting each other in their writing practices, it kind of ended up being. And that's where I crossed paths with Susan. Um, and through Susan came into uh, more and more conversations around Greater Than, uh, as well as through Manel Hededero, who invited me into Greater Than to teach a course. Um, and just over time kind of found myself uh, as a freelancer now, so after government, moving more and more into this space of kind of peer support and mutual aid, um, uh, as well as uh, in the process of co-founding a professional services cooperative out here in Vancouver as well named In Common. It has about six core members right now and we're planning to open up to the world this year. Um, and so through 
a lot of these uh, these interactions with different networks, greater than, in common, in spiral, I've really come to kind of appreciate, I think, how much we can overcome precarity together by collaborating on gigs, by collaborating on product design as we do with the Greater Than Academy. Um, and so for me, this, is, this has been the learning journey for the last two years is like, how do we navigate these relationships around money, around uh, value and impact that we're bringing to the world in a way that feels happy and good to the participants who are putting their time and energy into that. And I've found in many respects, a professional home with greater than through that. Um, and I'll pass off to Fran. Surprise. <laughs> Thanks, Stefan. Yeah, great to see everyone. So um, yeah, I guess my journey feels like it's been many years in the making. I guess uh, my and Susan's journey couldn't be more different in a way because I, I consider my, myself sort of a, a network community native because I've spent almost no, I would say maybe a few months time working in a sort of traditional company um, and straight out of university uh, in 2012, I jumped straight into a, a network that I think quite a few people from are here called WeShare. And so that's a, a Europe-based network that was really, I guess my sort of main starting and learning and exploration ground around new organizational structures and cultures. And I guess somehow for me, it became clear quite quickly that I just had no interest whatsoever in going back to the traditional work world after having dove in so deeply into that. Um, and I think, yeah, ever since I, I went into that journey, which, yeah, it's been like nine years now, um, through many different stages of, yeah, being a freelancer, working independently, working on many different projects, and also connecting with lots of other networks around the world that were doing similar things. I guess I've just been trying to figure out how can I keep doing this forever um, and make it sustainable throughout my different life stages and things that I would like to, to do. Um, also having sort of seen in some of these networks that once people are ready to you know, settle down and have children that they sort of leave and have to give it up um, because of this precarity and feeling like that's that's not what we want. Like we want this to be something that you can have a family with and, and keep going and do this work. So yeah, I think that's, that's what brings me here today and what was also, yeah, an important motivation for what we wanna create with Greater Than uh, for us to be able to do this, this work on new organizing structures really in the long term. So yeah, thank you and back to you, Kate. Amazing, thank you all. Um, so we're going to spend most of tonight's talk talking about the internal mechanics of greater than the how we how we organize internally how we get around this question of precarity but let's focus for a minute on what we do externally just to situate ourselves for our, our listeners. Um, Susan would you like to kick us off with a quick explanation. So the what of greater than uh, I suppose uh, is it's it's evolving, right? Um, it's it like any kind of entity that 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 comes together to do some work, it changes over time and it changes um, depending on who the people in the in the structure are and and what we're interested in and what the what the world is asking from us. And I know that sounds a, a little bit esoteric, but I think that greater than is a an interesting um, uh, manifestation of that. So. Uh, today, Greater Than um, serves organizations and leaders and individuals who are interested in uh, naming the water that we swim in, in terms of the structures that we've inherited around what, what work is, who are willing to look at those square in the face and challenge them through uh, experiments, through trying different things, through like intentionally practicing this part of their development so that they can better see and orient around uh, the structures that they're operating in. Uh, we do this through long-term accompaniment with organizations and leaders. Like for example, my longest gig is a 20 year gig I have with a uh, self-managing uh, 
a compostable tableware company in Northeast India uh, to doing short or long courses through the Greater Than Academy where, uh, you know, leaders of any stripe, um, be them like actual structural leaders in organizations or somebody who's merely interested in, wow, this question that, that uh, has been raised by all of us, like work doesn't have to be this way. What could we do differently? So we are a, I think how many people are in greater than sort of officially in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, um, in the membership now about 15 or 18, 18 of us, 18, 18 of us around the world. And yeah, it's going to be different tomorrow. And that's very exciting. Yeah. And maybe I can just uh, add into that, that I guess um, there's sort of like two, two dimensions that are quite important to us in, in our work and that most of us in Greater Than are there to do, which is on the one hand, helping different types of organizations um, experiment and adopt new organizing models and cultures and really implement them. And so those are sometimes uh, a lot of networks and communities, but also uh, like Susan was mentioning, maybe a more traditional company that wants to become self-managed or wants to yeah, transform how, how they're organized. But then at the same time, uh, we really want to develop our own products and do research and uh, really a, an important, I guess, origin story of Greater Than is also CoBudget, a collaborative budgeting tool. So uh, we actually maintain that open source uh, software and it's something that we wanna keep doing. And uh, it's also something we do with our, our online courses. So we're really trying to balance these two, uh, I guess, wishes and also uh, desires. On the one hand to support others, but also to really develop more uh, infrastructure and products and things that people can pick up really easily and that can sort of disseminate these practices in a, in a much broader way than you know, me spending a lot of hours with one specific person. Thank you for expanding on that. Do you want to add more on, on why, Fran? I think we talked a bit about that in your introduction. So I think actually we'll, we'll jump to this big question, um, the subject of tonight's talk. How is Greater Than operating that enables it and it, the people in it to tackle this thorny issue of precarity. Stefan, I might start with you. Like how, how greater than enables us to, as a collective of freelancers to tackle that thorny issue. Um, I'd say it's like, in a way, for me at least, it starts with stepping back a bit uh, and trying to ask ourselves more about what is precarity. There's a financial component to precarity, but then there's a lot of, um, I was kind of thinking about this before the call, there's a lot of other forms of value and income rolled into that as well that I think we'll get to in this conversation, which uh, is also quite important for how Greater Than tackles that together. And that's been kind of my experience with Greater Than as well is like, the, the community aspect, the aspect of our work where there is a sense of mutual aid and mutual understanding about how uh, we can kind of take care of each other on this journey um, in a space where we're recognizing that we're adults who are developing. We're, we're developing alongside one another. Um, we're still learning. We'll still, we're, we're still kind of pushing our boundaries. We're still um, interacting with our own edges together uh, in this very nice, um, collective approach to questions around livelihood, but also questions around, um, you know, other forms of income, other forms of value that I've never experienced uh, until I became a freelancer and until I started to work with collectives of freelancers. Never experienced it in my previous work life at all. I always joke to people that my previous work life, um, you know, I've read a lot of, I read a lot of theory <laughs> when I was younger. <laughs> So I was like pulling out the Oedipal Triangle, you know, the Oedipus complex, Freud, all this. I always feel like previous like life inside of government and inside of companies and corporations and things like this. It's just these daddy, mommy, me relationships that you're finding yourself in. And so in, in greater than um, it's, it's in a way it feels very much like, okay, wow, I, I left my house 
uh, when I was 18, I, I became an adult, so to speak, but I didn't become an adult really, truly until I, until I left my job. Now, leaving, leaving my job, like that opened me up to all sorts of precarity in terms of lifestyle, in terms of how much income I could uh, have, like all of these things, uh, huge exposure to the winds of the marketplace. Um, and a lot of discourse out there about how you should go it alone and this kind of like sole entrepreneur mindset, which I always thought was BS. Um, but didn't really feel and come to understand that until participating in a more kind of collective space around freelancing. So for me, like standing back, that's the context to come into the how for me. And the how then is really, it's about, you know, working together to figure out different forms of income. There's income that's like consulting gigs, um, which can be tricky to wrestle down to the ground sometimes and require a lot of biz dev work leading up to getting the contract, right? Um, and then there's other forms like product development, which is you know what we do through the academy. Um, and I think both of those avenues work in different ways for different people, but that's kind of the big how context from a financial perspective that you know, I see greater than as, as tackling precarity and, and trying to overcome it amongst the freelancers who participate in greater than. Uh, so, but I'll leave it at that. And then I'm curious to hear what others think as well. Oh, very nice, Stefan. I'll pass to, uh, to Francesca. Yeah, thanks, Kate. Um, it's definitely a really interesting question. And I guess when you first shared it with me, I was a bit like, ooh, shit. Like, you know, we know, we know this question is so important and it almost feels like uh, a lot of the work we're doing is uh, created around that question, but I feel like we're so far away from solving it. And maybe that's also just my, my pessimism or my sort of putting the goalpost too far ahead. Um, but yeah, I guess uh, I was sort of trying to take, take a bit of a step out and think about a couple different examples, thinking about, um, you know, greater than evolving, but also different networks and communities I'm in of how I've seen people try to address this question uh, of precarity. And I actually think that one of them is trying to create a more bounded group that's defined. And I guess basically what I mean by that is uh, if I look at uh, a community like WeShare or Inspiral, for instance, it's a, a big network that there's something about the fact that it's so large. And even though maybe you sort of know who's in it and who's out, but for instance, in the case of WeShare, you actually don't because it's a very uh, beautifully dynamic group. Um, if you don't know that, it's really hard to create sort of an environment where you feel like, oh, I know who I can count on and who's going to bring in the, the financial stability. And it just, it, it feels like it's very hard to actually experiment with those safety nets. And so what's really interesting, and maybe Susan can say more about this afterwards, is that um, I think from that came also this idea of a livelihood pod, which is like a small group of people that bound together to um, yeah, support each other with their livelihood. And there's been many different experiments around that. But there's been some people in WeShare that have been experimenting with that internationally. Um, and also, for instance, because WeShare is a very international group, so there's very many different uh, variations, let's say. And that in France, uh, especially in Paris, there's definitely much more of a collective vibe that got created. Um, and so there's sort of a more bounded group as well to sort of, yeah, um, counteract that, that sense of precarity. And in many ways, I feel like um, creating greater than was sort of my way to try to solve that question of, okay, how can we have a more clear bounded group of just people that say, yes, I'm buying into this long-term intention of creating more stability together and, and that financial abundance. And so to me, that feels like it's the first really important step to actually have that clarity of who are the people and what are they committing to together? And then, you know, there's so many questions that are still unanswered about how do you actually then crack that nut? but it feels like when you have those first pieces, then you can start experimenting. And that feels like it's sort of where we are right now. Maybe I'll let Susan chip in here. 
Yeah, and um, like like we've been sharing, this is this has gone beyond theory for all of us, right? Into like the actual nitty gritty of the of the experiments. Um, so, <laughs> orienting around bigger collectives like in Spiral and WeShare can be really difficult. Um, one of the differences between WeShare and in Spiral is that in Spiral has never been oriented around money. So, in Spiral has never been a place that you work. Well, maybe it was for a little while, but it hasn't been that for a long time. Um, in Spiral is really a place where we practice what it's like to be in mutual aid and support of each other through expressing the elements of uh, less a less hierarchical system, like making decisions together, like spending money together, and like really understanding, um, as has been in the chat, that precarity is not just about money. It's also about relationships, feeling like somebody has your back, feeling like you've got a group of trusted colleagues and, and, and a cohort that, um, is not only there, not only has your back sort of intellectually to help you kind of sort out what your, what, how to enact your meaningful work in the world, but also from a heart perspective. So when I, when I left corporate and I started experimenting in the Inspiral soil, I was like, I qu couldn't quite believe that this was real. I couldn't quite believe that there were humans that were really interested in supporting me on this journey, on my freelance journey. Um, I didn't quite believe that there was a place where I didn't have to do this on my own, but it, the rubber didn't really hit the road until uh, we started uh, experimenting or so we started seeing that there was a, a, a venture within Inspiral sorry for the vernacular, but there's kind of no other way to, to describe it, called Root Systems. And Root Systems had, was a, was a uh, pod of uh, uh, web developers. And what they had discovered was that uh, the up and down of individual freelancer income was really lumpy, right? So some somebody like Fran might have a contract that where she's like abundant for a month and then she's got a couple of months where she's looking for more work so she's not so abundant. But in that time, Stefan might you know, be really abundant. So what could it be like if there was an experiment in collectivizing the money so that instead of, you know, Fran making five grand one month and nothing the next month, that everybody made two and a half grand or that, and, and so to like even out that that um, precarity of not having um, a predictable predictable livelihood from a, from a financial perspective. And so then myself, Kate, uh, Joshua Vile, and Damien Sligo Green decided that we would uh, form a pod and we called it the Golden Pandas. And we had, we had lots of interesting ideas about it becoming a product pod that never came to pass, right? That we never actually did align on any project products we could do together. And that's probably because we were all sort of starting to birth our own, um, our own meaningful work in the world. So so Joshua was working on the Inspiral Academy. I was working on my consulting. Damien was working on something else. But for th three years, two or two and a half to three years, we collectivized our money, bootstrapped our enterprises or our our freelancer work that way. And by the time we kind of changed from being a livelihood pod to something else, our individual work was so stable that we were able to move on to the next thing without that financial precarity. It's one example, two examples. Thank you, Susan. I'll just pass back to Francesca to talk concretely about what we do around it in greater than in terms of how money flows. Yeah, so um, this is always a great question because I guess I've, I've been speaking to a lot of different like freelancer network groups lately and they always ask me like, so how much percent do people have to give from their contracts into the middle? That seems to be like a really, um, yeah, burning question often and it's definitely one of a lot of debate. But so looking at the, the current money agreements around greater than is that basically people that are uh, partners, um, they put all of their work through greater than so like it's, you know, part of part of the greater than company projects and 15% of each project goes into a common pot. Uh, and then with associates, they sort of have the option. And this is definitely something that we're like still wrangling with this question of what makes something a project that sort of contributes to the system and when does it not. 
this is a tension that I've seen pop up in many, many different forms. Uh, when people sort of have their personal identity and lots of different projects they contribute to that they don't really know where should I be contributing. Um, but yeah, overall, basically 15% of the projects that people deem uh, greater than projects, they, they go into the middle, uh, which some people see as that being super low, others see that as super high. It depends on who you're talking to. And it's really, uh, it, it's a continuous debate. But overall, the, the idea is that those funds that go into the core, um, that that helps us maintain a, a shared infrastructure and also take some of the, the heavy lifting off of our plates in terms of administration, and that we have surplus to make shared investments, which is definitely something that uh, we wanna do a lot more of, but that we've, we've done in small amounts. For instance, our, our academy, uh, well, that was actually a shared investment that we made where we took 25,000 euros from our budget and said, okay, we're gonna put all of the surplus into kickstarting this project. So that's something we hope to keep doing more. Um, but I guess one thing that I guess I find really interesting about this question of, you know, what to do about precarity, I guess to connect with what Stefan, you were saying about it not just being about money. And I guess somehow my, my current conclusion of where I think we're at is that we're having conversations about it and we're having conversations uh, about each other's well-being, about each other's needs, um, financially and non-financially. And I think that that actually gets you quite quite far already in terms of uh, achieving or like doing something against this precarity. So I guess what I mean by that really concretely um, is that uh, one one practice that we have, it's actually called the, the happy money story. And it's a, it's a practice that we use in a lot of our projects to distribute budgets. So basically, let's say we have a contract and we have, you know, a, a three months of work, basically, and we have the budget for, for that specific contract. Then we sit down with the people that worked on it and we do sort of this practice where each person shares um, how they feel about the project and their contribution uh, and what things are important to them at the moment and what needs they have. Uh, financially and also in terms of being acknowledged for the work and through that you um, as a group each person can generate a proposal for how the money is split and basically the objective it's a bit like a game is that uh, someone comes up with a winning proposal that everyone feels happy with and the objective is really that people feel happy at the end and that you come up with creative ways to uh, meet everyone's needs so it's maybe not just, oh, you know, I'll give you this, this more money or something else, but maybe I'm going to come and, I don't know, help you clean up your garden or do something else. But basically, the reason I'm mentioning this example is that what we're really trying to do is have a much more holistic approach to uh, money flow and, and our needs and look at like, okay, what, is, what does Kate need to be happy, right, and feel good and be like not in a precarious situation, right? as an example, then we, we talk about that as a group, we try to make space for that uh, to, to make sure that people don't fall through the cracks and that they're not falling off the edge without you noticing it. So to me, that is that's sort of the, the, the best we can do for now um, and hopefully get into some much more concrete experiments um, around, you know, maybe some kind of minimal basic incomes to people, or I'm definitely very, very curious to experiment with these things more. But for now, I do think that <clears throat> opening those communication channels about money uh, and, and these needs is really valuable. Yeah, very nice. I guess we are touching on some big su subjects and um, it's quite it's a common kind of uh, subject to avoid talking about money. Um, you know, in most organizations, you have an agreement about your salary and that's with HR and this, who hires you. So there's a lot of things that you're talking about that you people need to kind of unlearn or perhaps learn when we, we think about what it means to collaborate, what it means to talk about money, what it means to, to be in an emergent system like this where, as you, as you mentioned, Fran and Susan, experiments are happening, things are shifting, things are changing. 
Some part of me is actually like, oh, is this breeding more precarity? It's what comes up. But so my question now is like, what, what do you each think is needed in terms of the personal steps one might have to take to actually step into this system? Because I think we've, we're, you know, obviously we're in this, this collective for a reason, because, you know, the old system, which is get a job at a consultancy, leave your autonomy at the door, get your 30 days off a year. If you live in Europe, maybe it's, I think it's 12 in America. <laughs> um, use the framework of the boss to deliver what's needed to the client. That's not that inspiring. And also we, we've kind of, I think we're in consensus that it's a bit, it's really hard to be this freelancer working alone. And you can see, you know, the Upworker, the Fiverr Lancer, these models are so geared towards competition, a race towards the bottom, lowering the prices to the, the lowest possible. Um, and we don't want to go in that direction. So what is needed for people to take a step into a collective like Greater Than, perhaps in a different vertical? Um, what do people need to grow into? I'll start with uh, Stefan again. Thanks, Kate. That's a really good question. Um, and I'm going to I'm going to tie it back to the moment in my history where I decided to kind of take the plunge and jump in. Um, and I think what is needed in that moment from a personal standpoint is, is to be ready to kind of wrestle with, um, you know, your own money story, your own uh, story around status anxiety that you may have. Um, and if you're in a partnership or a relationship with another person, or you have dependents, to do that work out loud together and really kind of talk about, uh, you know, what, what looks like enough for everyone, you know, what enoughness is for everyone. Because when you step into this space of freelancing and when you step into the space of collectivizing around that, you're entering, you're, you're walking away from, um, you know, like a, a consistent paycheck that you can kind of depend on, right? And you're stepping into this mode where you need to start thinking more about how you handle um, periods of scarcity and periods of abundance as well, where you actually need to bring in more people because you actually can't handle it uh, on your own. So all of, all of those kind of ugly feelings in the very beginning, I think, I think you just need to be kind of sitting with them and processing them. The way I did it was to challenge myself in a very kind of real way by literally, um, you know, leaving a house that we were renting and road schooling our children for a few years and, and house sitting and doing all sorts of crazy things out of the back of a truck camper. And also, you know, starting a consulting business and doing all of these things, right? Um, so my relationship with money in that moment changed quite a bit. And I really drilled deep into the status anxiety that was driving me beforehand to, uh, to amass wealth for all sorts of weird, fucked up reasons from my past. <laughs> so <laughs> kind of, you know, dealing with yourself and your own story around money, I think is a really key part of stepping into this. And I know Susan and, and Fran, you guys, we've, we've chatted about this quite a bit, like, and we, there's debate in our, in our midst, like how do, how do we handle bringing somebody into something like Happy Money Story? Do we just bring somebody in or should they be working on their money story first a bit? Like how do, how do we deal with that situation? Um, or, you know, do we just bring them in and, and you learn by doing, so to speak? So this is still a, a question in many respects for us. Who wants to pop? Susan. I'll go ahead and pop. I mean, I mean, for me, it's, it's, in my experience, it's about the relationships first and foremost, right? So we can have all of these tools and structures and alternative methodologies for doing this stuff. But unless you, unless you actually try, love and trust the people that you're working with, this become I don't I don't think it's possible personally, and so then that gets into the into like this very mushy territory of what does it take to build a strong enough relationship where I mean even beyond the fact like some of the some of the really basic questions I get about this stuff is 
well, if you're all sharing the same bank account, how do you make sure that somebody just doesn't run away with all the money? It's, it's, it, 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 it can be that simple, but it also goes beyond that. And not only practicing how we are um, supporting each other and not projecting our, our own personal money stories onto, onto our peers, there's so much in the way of this work that needs to be done here and here. Um, but that goes back to your point, Kate, that, you know, work, uh, uh, Kate and Stefan, like work provides us so much of the like raw material to become adults, to continue our kind of human evolution as, 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 as people, you know, we are not fully grown at 18 or even 20 or even 50. Um, but you know, the joy of, being in relationship, understanding our interdependence and working with it is just, it's just joyful. It's just joyful. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point, Susan, about the relationships that I feel like it's really important to make explicit about what I would describe as like our space. Because I think that um, in our work context, almost everyone in Greater Than is part of one or multiple different communities. And let's just say as a, as a caricature, it's not the case for everyone. But many of us, we have a certain amount of our time that we spend like connecting with random people and having calls with them and just getting to know them or giving advice. Uh, we go to different gatherings where we'll spend, you know, a few days immersed with people just building those relationships. And I think that it's a really critical piece like that we're sitting on top of basically. And that I think it, it, it lifts up the, the, the potential of what we can do. Like it wouldn't be there if we didn't have this extremely strong web of relationships uh, that many of these communities are, are providing us. And so I think that as someone who's maybe coming into this newer or is looking at it from the outside, I'm not sure you see the amount of investment that is going into that. So I think it's probably important to talk about. And I guess the other piece that I find really interesting or that is, I feel like the, the nut that we're trying to crack is that you sort of need uh, like things that create alignment and like a focused energy uh, within these different groups to really, you know, do bigger things. Um, and to take on certain types of projects and, and to create that stability. And I think um, that's something that we really uh, wrangle with a bit because in the sort of freelancer culture, everyone's really used to being able to be quite picky about what they do and what they don't do and what topics they're interested in and, and which they aren't. So to me, what really is, is an important, I guess, thing that we need to get better at almost, I don't wanna use the word compromise, but it's something around like being okay with saying, I'm gonna work on this thing that's maybe not exactly my absolute favorite thing, but maybe it makes sense for me because it's building the, the bigger thing together. And so that's the alignment part that I think is the, the, the thing we're trying to figure out. And that's something like greater than where we have really clear, like a clear vertical that's more defined that we're trying to, to gather around. That if you combine that, with these, these networks, I think it's really interesting, but it still feels very uh, unfinished and in, in being figured out. Great. So we've got 14 minutes left and we need a couple of minutes at the end to wrap up, but there's some really good questions coming through in the chat. Um, I wanna ask the the last question that was asked from about doing work in different countries, where has it gone? Who asked that question? Would you like to speak at, well, doing freelancer collectors when we have very diverse um, daily uh, economic systems like the EU, US and Ukraine? Whoever asked that, would you like to, Fabrice, Fabrice would you like to take off your mic and ask the question? Sorry. Is it me? I think so. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, I was wondering what the, um, is it really realistic to think about building a collective with people experiencing very different economic realities? Uh, I have worked with many freelancers in Ukraine, US and, and Africa, and um, it's not always the intuitive thing uh, that 
come alive, but it, I think it's these people or, or with outsourcing in Vietnam, people experience very different realities, might have to support a family, might have to, to look just for the next paycheck and have fun. Uh, is it really, is it, don't, don't you need a kind of similar sort of concerns to be, to have a, to have a collective? Yeah, it's a good question. And who of the talkers wants to take this one? I could take a, a quick start at it. I mean, I would say that in uh, all of the collectives, like well, so I'm most involved in Greater Than right now because it's focused on this vertical of helping organizations transform, become self-management oriented. And a lot of that also involves facilitation, which is kind of my area of expertise. So focused a lot in Greater Than, also co-founding in common. And in both of those settings, I'd say everybody is coming from a diverse background of like, like I have a family, for instance, uh, Fran and Manel are, are single bachelor, you know, they're like, <laughs> they're together in a relationship without, without kids. And, and then other people are coming as individuals. So it's, it is very, and we're coming from other currency areas as well. So I think from me, when you were saying that, this, the first thing I thought about was like, you know, what we're trying to do here is we're always trying to move in the direction of abundance, whether it's like, you know, charging for courses in euros, for instance, that helps our abundance with currency exchange all around the world. Um, or trying to pursue big ticket uh, consulting gigs by focusing on cryptocurrency companies, for example, as, as Kate uh, is, is doing through our business development conversations, like that creates abundance, more abundance, right? Um, as opposed to maybe focusing on consulting gigs that might be in places where the, where the currency rate of exchange is much lower, that, that might be a way kind of to think about it, but I'll leave it at that and let, let the others respond to. I think yeah, I could add a slightly opposing point, or it's not exactly opposing, but I do think that by default, we're going to gravitate towards people that are more similar to us um, in terms of their like, yeah, financial situation or like that whole sort of package of needs. Like I think it's definitely something that's lower friction. It's it's going to be easier if everyone has similar, you know, if if we all say yes, right now we, we need to make as much money as possible. So we're going to go after a certain type of contract that's really boring, but it's going to pay a lot. If everyone is on the same page about that. It's going to be quite easy. But then if some people are like, no, I only want to do something that fully is in this exact little mini uh, category of, of purpose, otherwise I'm going to say no. Like, I think that that, that can create quite a lot of um, difficulties. So I think I would say, um, we really want to try to have this diversity and for these different uh, needs, but I think it requires quite a lot of work um, to be able to do that and to like hold those discrepancies and those different ways that people are gonna show up and how much people can contribute and to also really uh, confront and discuss the different ways in which people are gonna contribute because maybe one person can put a lot of money in and someone else can put in time or they have a certain super skill. And so I do think that yeah, we shouldn't underestimate that that is going to be more work, but I do think it absolutely is, is worth it and that we should be trying to do that. Yeah, for sure. We're trying to, we have um, people in our ecosystem in India um, in Eastern Europe. Susan actually lives in New Zealand where it's not necessarily a hugely economic system, but the, the New Zealand dollar where I'm from is um, almost half, uh, a bit over half of the euro. And so there is definitely a difference when you're working for uh, US dollars, British pound. Um, and we just try to integrate that in terms of the money story and what we're showing up with and our need. Um, but I wanna move on to a question before we start to wrap up from Shane, um, which was around this question about families. Um, Shane, are you there? Would you like to voice your question for us? Sure, sure. Thanks, Kate. Um, yeah, and maybe to make it more broader, more applicable for everyone, is just how do you plan for precarity across different stages of life? Um, I think 
I spent the first part of my career working kind of for very little, and now I don't have the support that I would like to have for a family, but I find myself going or being pushed even more into precarity, taking on more freelance work. Um, and so I'm trying to think ahead and think for more people than just myself. But I found with some of the structures, organizational structures I work in, it's becoming more difficult. And so how do I kind of balance those competing forces? Yeah, great question. Stefan, you've been thinking about this a lot. I'll let you answer and then we'll keep moving. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's a, it's a nut I'm still cracking as well. Like I entered the freelancing space about two years ago. And so, uh, you know, we had to, we had to put our investments on pause that we were doing regularly through the government job I used to have. So all of that stuff was put on pause. Um, and really it was put on pause also thinking about the, the risk reward of, of this kind of work. So I, I struggled when I was in government uh, to, you know, to move up the ladder, so to speak, and get, I promoted all of these things up into management and stuff. And it was always just a huge uh, amount of struggle to, to get those higher paying roles. And then when you finally had them, it wasn't really that much more money per year, like a few more thousand dollars a year. Um, and so what attracted me to the freelance space was in the kind of beginning stages, I knew it was gonna be a bit more feast famine, lumpy kind of stuff. But I knew that if I could stick with it for five or 10 years, that there would be a good return on investment of that time and energy as I deepened my expertise and my practice, deepened the kind of offerings that I was giving, deepened the network that I was working within and doing business development in. So for me, that's kind of how I'm answering it to myself, how my wife and I are answering it to ourselves is that we would rather do work that we're passionate and interested in and uh, wait for um, you know, a lot of the surplus that we could then redirect towards children's education funds and things like this later down the road when we start generating more surplus than we could ever have done if we were just working as a, you know, a manager in a government office. So that it's kind, you have to kind of think of it like that. And then you have to think about the risk that you would be putting around that investment later on, because it's easier to take risks with small investments if you start early with their educational savings. But if you start later, you know, you might be able to put more money in from doing higher paid consulting gigs and things like this. But, but um, you know, now you have less time to play with. So you can't be too risky with what you're investing your money in in that moment so these are some things that i think about uh, alongside like do i even want to invest in this economic system in any like you know like it's it's so ugly and terrible and it's not serving the needs of my children and their future so so that's a big question as well so what are what am i investing in for my children is it like money in an education savings account or is it an awesome five acre permaculture farm where they can plant fruit trees. And so this is another question that we're also dealing with right now. Great, thank you, Stefan. And thanks for the question, Shane. Um, we've just got a few minutes left. Um, and I'll just ask each of the Francesca, Susan, Stefan for just a, a parting um, comment or reflection that's come up for you from tonight's talk. And then I'll check us out. Susan, go ahead. Thanks, Kate, and thanks everybody. This has been a, a really lively conversation and thanks everybody in the audience for your questions and your uh, curiosity. So for, for me, one of, the, one of the big things here is that, you know, until I was almost 50 years old, I never knew that this was an option, right? So I was on the, I was on the treadmill. I felt like I was like one of those wind up dolls, just kept on going down the treadmill because I wasn't, I was, maybe willfully blind, maybe not willfully blind to like the systems that were controlling my expectations of work and livelihood. And so I think that with this grand experiment is that we are like enacting as humans, for me is just giving people um, the opportunity to see that there is a different way. And, you know, let's cut the bullshit. It's not easy. It's so hard. Like, you know, it, it's, it's, it takes everything. And yet for me 
And for us, the payoff has been beyond measure. It's not for everybody. And I have to say that it is a very privileged uh, position that you that we are all in to even be able to, t to take these risks. So I'm well aware of that. But, you know, it's possible and we're here to support in any way we can. Great. Thank you, Francesca. Yes, I know we're running out of time. Um, yeah, I think a key, uh, a key thing that I think we need going forward for these systems to, to develop more, um, or if I think about the, the type of person that wants to get involved in something like this, to me it seems like this sort of combination of uh, knowing about your personal boundaries and somehow getting really clear on that, including your needs, and somehow coupling that with seeing the bigger picture and wanting to take that, that leap of faith or that, that risk, as Susan was saying, to, to build something bigger together. And so I think that's those are the kind of people that I want to meet more of and want to see more building, building these kind of alternative org models around the world um, with those combining those two elements. Great. Uh, Stefan, I will I'll let you have 30. Do you have a tweet for me? I'll put it in chat and that way you can wrap us up. Great. So thanks everyone for coming to our one hour deep dive into this topic. Um, we will be holding another webinar that actually goes a kind of a step even deeper next week, which is called Thriving Networks, The Money Problem. Um, and we have a guest speaker from an amazing group called Open Collective joining us, as well as our colleague Alicia and Francesca again. And we'll be really going into yeah, a few more of the questions that were raised tonight, looking a lot at some of the networks that are on the, the, the rise globally, who are changing the, the notion of a traditional organization, about who are encountering this problem around how do we pay the people to do the work so we're not just rebuilding um, mechanisms that mean more precarity for people. So next week we'll be going even deeper and getting to some concrete business models that you can use where it's not necessarily just consulting. So thanks to Eleanor's just dropping the link to that in the chat. Thanks to everyone joining tonight. Um, super rich conversation and thanks to our speakers. And we're on time. Thanks everybody. Thanks everybody. Thank you for coming. Thanks all. Feel free to take off mics, people, if you want to. We've got Marge here. Hello. And we've got and Thanks for coming. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Alma can. Yeah, I don't know if people can unmute themselves. No. Do you unmute? But that's about as far. Oh, I might stay on if there's opportunity to chat. We can unmute ourselves. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're starting something right here, right now Are in we, this actually? particular oh, room. So I'm cool. really sorry about that. But um... okay, bye. Susan, this bye. Is thank you. It's going to be in a different room, no? Not in this uh, room. This is a custom. I was in a custom room, room with my. Yeah. Okay, then you can yeah. stay. But Stefan and I have to go teach. Lots of love. <laughs> See ya. Bye. bye. bye.